noted, ladies and gentlemen, the map we projected marking active U.S. military bases which surround Iran's borders from every aspect, with the exception of the north and the country's borders with Russia. Whether through invaded territories such as Iraq and Afghanistan, or as a consequence of NATO in Turkey, or through countries ruled by Arab kings and sultans, who are in effect the best clients the US economy could dream of, securing billions of dollars worth of trade in arms and military equipment, and also those countries such as Egypt and Israel, who practically are on a US payroll, receiving billions of dollars in aid, the United States demonstrates how it is a shameless bully in the Middle East. And, and so I pose, posit the question, who is shaking the fist, the clenched fist here? Further, and in order to discredit Iran, and in addition to policies of disinformation, demonization, and Iranophobia, the United States has in the past three decades endeavored to cripple Iran through severe economic sanctions, extended even to freedom of thought and scientific practice and research. These endeavors demonstrate not only economic aggression, but intellectual violence on those scientists still remaining in Iran. In brief, ladies and gentlemen, sanctions started in 1980 with freezing over $8 billion Iranian assets, not disclosing the $20 billion accounts held by the departing Shah and boycotting Iranian imports. Iran's uranium enrichment program at Natanz, however, has prompted further damage since February 2003. This has been despite the visits and inspections of UN's nuclear monitoring body and the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA. More potent additional economic sanctions in May 2006 were put in place preventing trade with any US-based oil company and their subcontractors, wherever in the world they may be, <coughs> and thus blocking business operations with Iran internationally. In December 2006, the US Security Council imposed sanctions on Iran's trade in sensitive nuclear materials and technology under the United Nations <coughs> Resolution 1747 in March transactions of Iran's state-owned bank and Iran's arms exports and the activities of Iran's Revolutionary Guards were sanctioned with global effect. Security Council Resolutions 1803 on Iran in March 2008 extends sanctions against Iran through its members prompting cargo inspection. The resolution also adds 13 names to an existing travel ban on assets and asset free assets um, on scientifically oriented institutions and individuals. Iran continues to say it cannot accept a requirement which is legally defective and politically coercive. Iran rejects the double standards that the nuclear suppliers group uses in its decision on what countries can and cannot pursue in nuclear energy programs. While denying internal, internal rows on Iran, the International Atomic Agency, IAEA, has claimed that Iran has resolved most issues concerning its alleged nuclear activities, but questions remain over the country's research into nuclear war warheads and uranium enrichment. There is a suggestion of a global rift, and several UN member states have discarded overextending sanctions against Iran, insisting that the case against Iran remains unproven. Iran further claims it has complied with all six outstanding issues that were included in the original IAEA work plan for Iran, and that the uranium enrichment program was never a part of the work plan and does not have to be resolved. Iran claims that the UN Security Council's involvement is unnecessary because it has been in full cooperation with the IAEA and that these decisions are forced by a few to advance their hegemonic agenda. However, 
the ordinary people, the decent citizens of Iran, suffer in silence. Sanctions are a slow death for many such citizens in Iran. There is little discussion in Iran of the effect of the sanctions over the past decades. The official governmental discourse reiterates that Iran will not be the servant of the US and finds other channels for trade through China and even recently through Germany. In my recent trip to Tehran, I made inquiries in the bazaar, the traditional center for commerce. With the national bank in Iran being under direct sanctions, financial transactions with the world are practically at a halt. The steel merchant discussed the, compiled, discussed the complicated ways through which they are forced to arrange purchases with numerous costly middlemen based mostly in the Gulf countries. The knock-on effect is felt substantially in the construction business, where many workers and builders are laid off, and securing steel bars, for example, are near to impossible, both in terms of the unreasonable price increase and availability. Similarly, a widely recognized and major merchant in gold, silver, gems, and antique objects complained about the impossibility of benefiting from the strong potential visitors to the bazaar offer. Whether from the three million strong Iranian diaspora scattered all over the world, many of whom visit Iran during the summer and Nowruz holidays and wish to purchase with credit cards, or ordinary tourists who wish to use their credit cards to shop for souvenirs, no such transactions can take place. The, sh the sanctions strongly inhibit the merchants direct access to, to credit card facilities worldwide. And the middlemen in Dubai, for example, demand unacceptable percentages to facilitate this service to the merchants and the private sector. As a grave consequence of these obstacles, both the steel merchant and the precious metal and gem merchant told me that they have laid off numerous technicians, junior and senior salespersons, and young apprentices. The damage here is multiple, hitting the center of the traditional industries and the economically vulnerable classes who stuck in the bazaar and to become one day self-employed. This was echoed by a factory owner who, for wood products, for interiors, who informed me he has had to lay off over 50 skilled workers and sublet his factory because of a lack of uh, 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 projects to sustain his workforce. Such cases cannot be viewed in isolation, ladies and gentlemen. Further, in the private sector, a manager in a major telecommunication center and computing and electronic technologies informed me that in the past two years, it has become impossible to secure parts for the several million dollar range of equipment in use and available for purchase in their company. Those spare parts which are available via Gulf, the Gulf countries, namely <coughs> Dubai, are not compatible to the range of equi equipment purchased and under guarantee from the representatives of the US manufacturers just two or three years ago. The civic aviation under the government's charge and the lack of spare parts vital to secure the safety of the citizens of Iran when traveling by air is directly hit and undermined because of sanctions. In July and August 2008, I was an invited speaker at the 7th Biennale of Iranian Studies Conference in Toronto, Canada, where over 80 candidates from Iran, PhD students and younger academics were denied visa and participation as a result of uh, sanctions on entry and against scientific activity. Such intellectual violence is far from the claims to value systems, academic independence, and freedom of speech we so often hear about in the West. Thus, ladies and gentlemen, the Iranian people suffer, and suffer quietly and unnoticed, <clears throat> whether a junior hand in the bazaar, a technician, or a young scholar. Iran, like any modern country, needs new resources to sustain development and continued reconstruction, especially in the aftermath of the long years of war with Iraq.
Maintaining economic stability and confidence is crucial for Iran, especially in the contemporary period with an ever-increasing educated youth demanding jobs and reasonable stan standards and wanting to be part of the world. Thus, in real terms, the imposed sanctions on Iran are an economic and psychological warfare against the Iranian nation. Sanctions have created more inflation, ultimately damaging trade's infrastructure. Sanctions have undermined business confidence, making the economy particularly vulnerable and damaging the poorest and the most vulnerable in society. Sanctions addressed at the Iranian government is destroying the lives and livelihoods of the Iranian people, particularly those with lowest income standards, damaging children and the
President Obama that Iran's nuclear program is not a new idea. It was first designed in 1957 under America's Atoms for Peace project. The United States wanted Iran's territorial expanse to be at its disposal as a strategic military base in the region in relation to the Cold War and the Soviet Union. The map, ladies and gentlemen, also demonstrates that it is the Americans who hold up their fist at Iranians for having interrupted their imperialism. I thank you. for bravely battling on. You see what Iranian women are made of, don't you? <laughs>